Okay, so Uriel and Manfred, thank you both so much for joining us this morning. Is this the first time you've been interviewed together? Um, I think we, we had one recording some years ago. I was asked to take part in a film called Generation to Generation. And I was interviewed by grandchildren con concerning my testimony. They asked me questions. We all sat around the table. Uriel was in Israel, but um, he's a bit of a computer wizard. And he managed to uh, show himself on a computer screen. And he asked me questions all the way from Israel relating to, to the topic we were speaking about. So he, he effectively interviewed me from 2,000 miles away. And this became part of, of that film, which is available on, on YouTube, I believe, called Generation to Generation. So th that was effectively a sort of replica of today. So, so I, I, how would you both... So I remember interviewing you, but I don't think I've ever watched it. So I'm going to have to watch it. You'll you'll find it somewhere on YouTube. I, I don't know how to direct you, but I'll find you're it. Much cleverer than I am on computer, yeah. and uh, I, I have no doubt if you put put your mind to it, you you'll find it. So Uriel, I know from my conversations with you, the huge respect you have for your grandfather. Can you? How would you describe your relationship? So I think as his oldest grandchild, I think we had a very special relationship. Uh, I think from every week on the, on the Shabbos, he used to come play with us, with me from a very young age, uh, up until a couple of years ago. Um, we've always had the relationship since, since then, even from Israel, every time they come to Israel, uh, to Netanya, uh, going to them for the weekend or for Chagim, uh, to speaking, to doing Zooms and uh, recently WhatsApp video calls. Uh, and now that he has his first great grandson, needing to spend more time on videos, and uh, he's going to see he's going to see Itai soon in the next couple of days. Um, so I think we've always had a very special relationship. Manfred, would you agree? I, I agree entirely. Yes, I can tell you one instance where the Uriel was incredibly helpful. Many years ago, with my wife at my side. I paid my first visit to Yad Vashem in Yerushalayim and after a few minutes I was so emotionally overcome that I burst into tears and had to leave and for decades I could not bring myself to return to Yad Vashem until on one occasion Uriel, well, he was in the army but he had leave when we were there and he offered to accompany us both my wife Shari and me, and he said he, he, he would um, do his best to, to give me the strength to do this. And indeed he did. As a result of Uriel's support, I managed to get right through um, Yad Vashem. I, I remember distinctly entering one room at Yad Vashem, which listed the 12 most brutal concentration camps established by the Nazis, and I was not totally surprised to see the name Stutthof among those. Stutthof was a camp in which I was um, held twice, once in 1944 and once at, uh, early in 1945, until we were sent from Stutthof on a death march. And particularly on the second occasion, Stutthof had changed in character. Initially, when it was first formed, opened in 1939, Stutthof did not house any Jews. It was reserved for German non-Jewish anti-Nazis who were sent there, um, criminals were sent there, um, homosexuals, gypsies, and also Polish resistance fighters, those who were not killed by the Nazis, some of them were sent to Stutthof, but no Jews. It was a small camp which had a limit of about 8,000 people 
the accommodation. But later in the war, in 1943, the camp was tripled in size. The fence was extended. Incidentally, it, it, it had a high voltage electric fence surrounding it. But the Germans had such a phobia about people escaping that in addition to that electric fence, which actually electrocuted people if you touched it, and I noticed later on, towards the end of the war, some people couldn't take any more punishment and attempted to electrocute themselves to end their suffering. But in addition to that, the Nazis had erected guard towers at intervals around the perimeter, and they were manned by armed guards. And if they spotted anyone attempting to make their way to the electric fence, they would just shoot them. So very few of them actually achieved their objective of taking their own life. In fact, instead, they were murdered by the, one of the guards by, by, by a shot. That's, That's how Stuttgart had changed. And when the camp was extended in 1943, it was tripled in size. The, the capacity increased from 8,000 to 25,000. They took the opportunity of building into the camp at that same time a gas chamber and a crematorium. So, in that sense, Stutthof now was on a par with Auschwitz. It had mass extermination facilities, not on the same scale as Auschwitz. In fact, a year or so after this uh, machinery was installed in, in Stutthof, <laughs> the Nazis decided that the gas chamber was no longer sufficiently large for their purposes and they brought in two of those cattle trucks so effectively closed wagons and made them airtight and used them as auxiliary gas chambers so they could murder a larger number of jews in, in a shorter time that that's how stutthof transformed towards the end of the war from a labor camp where people were worked slowly to death into an extermination camp, um, not on by no means on the same scale as uh, as Auschwitz, but uh, nevertheless it had these facilities. And as I told you, the Nazis enlarged the facility by bringing in extra gas chambers. As a result, it meant that the crematorium, working 24 hours a day, could not cope with the number of bodies sent there. So the excess bodies were just lined up out in the open and when the pile was large enough, the Nazis attempted to set them on fire and burn them just out in the open. That was Stutthof okay. the second time I was there. Can I, can I ask you, obviously giving an extremely powerful testimony as you're doing. Sorry, you, you're you too faint. Or you will have to repeat the question to me, please. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I see. Okay. I'm, I, I, yes. Okay. Fine. So, Uriel, the question is to you. What does your grandfather represent to you? So, I think my grandfather represents strength, uh, being able to go through what he and obviously many others went through and to come out of it and to carry on with life and not to give up uh, and to build a family uh, is something which is something to emulate. Uh, I hope none of us will go through the same struggles, but it definitely shows us how strong, how strong hu humans will to, to live and to continue is. And how, how often now, obviously his, your grandfather has had a huge impact on you and your your perspective on life since i've met you your work you, you made alia from london very determined to make alia uh, you work for magin david adom um, and now you are a reserve soldier in the idf has that whole chain of events been inspired by your grandfather's story of, of survival and resilience 
so I think there was always an aspect of Israel there. Um, generally, as a family, um, traveling to Israel, talking about Israel, uh, it was always it was always there. And the fact that we all understood that at the end of the day, there is nowhere, there is nowhere we're safe um, outside of Israel where we can protect ourselves, even if sometimes it's difficult here. Um, and my grandfather, I was actually, we were actually at Saban Safta on November 7th when, uh, when everything started. We were in their, in their apartment in Netanya with them um, for the Chag. Um, I think even with that, it's still a stronger feeling. I definitely feel a lot safer in Israel uh, than I would have felt being outside of Israel. I think now if I was outside of Israel, I would definitely want to come back. I would definitely want to be here. Uh, so I think as part of the lessons learned of history, is we need our own, we need our own place, we need our own country, and this is where this is where home is for us. And Manfred, my question to you, Earl, if you want to repeat it, what does it mean to him to have survived the Holocaust and now have a grandson serving as so, a reservist so start with the in the question. IDF? So, Sabah, the question for you is, um, what does it mean to you to having gone through what you went through and now to have a grandson serving as a reservist in the IDF? I couldn't feel more proud than I do feel about our first eldest grandson, Uriel. He, he's a remarkable young man and he certainly has a sort of leadership abilities in that sense he, he he takes after his father his father is our firstborn our eldest son and right from early years in school later in in yeshiva um, he always emerged uh, as a, a macha he he was the one who founded um the weekly football game when he was in yeshiva on Fridays that, that, that they usually had time off. And he, after the ex yeshiva had existed for many years without a Friday football match, he was the one who organized it. And I believe it, it's uh, taken root. It, it continues to this day. And it's more than 40 years since our son was there uh, and started it. Later on, uh, he, he founded um, a local... Uh, cricket, he became mad on cricket. Whatever our son got interested in was all consuming. At one point, our house was almost unlivable in because he suddenly got very fond of pop music and it was blaring through our house all day long. Whenever uh, David was around, there was pop music blaring. That, that was the sort of young man he was. Whatever he took on, he did wholeheartedly and sort of turned in, in, into a, a leader. As I said, he, he founded this cricket team, which played locally in our park every Sunday. And um, one, one of the very keen participants, in fact, was a local rabbi, a young rabbi, who was also very keen on cricket. He, he became a member of this cricket team, and it was known as the Shire Hall All-Stars. And it continued after David um, became an accountant and uh, began work and uh, had to lessen his participation in these activities. But th that, that's sort of rubbed off on Uriel. And he likewise, during his time in Israel, um, perhaps not intentionally, but sort of it seems to come naturally to him, um, he, he has um, sort of emerged as someone who, whose views um, are, are uh, wanted, and he has. I've heard him on on radio as as a representative of MDA, Magen David Adon, repeatedly, and he's coherent, literate, clear, and factual. He tells things as they are which I'm very happy about. And I also add the question to you, Uriel, that the saying that he who saves a life saves the world entire, and there seems to be symmetry there that you were as a senior EMT. A paramedic. 
so the, the fact that you are a paramedic, that you are saving lives, uh, that seems to have symmetry. Yeah, so uh, there was also something from the family, uh, both sides. My grandfather on my other side was a doctor, my mother's a nurse, my father used to volunteer as, a, uh, as an EMT as well. Uh, so it was definitely something there in the family. And then when I came to Israel, I was volunteering for Magenda Bidon before I started working there. Uh, in the army, I uh, did an EMT course as well. And now my role, now my role in the in the army is also a uh, in a medical role. So I'm saying we'll go through again. Dante, what is wrong? Sorry. Uh, where do you want to start? Can you can you can you use why just why just it or do you need to to redo the answer? Yes. Sorry, some. Okay, sorry, some some meeting. So there's definitely symmetry there. Um, there's definitely symmetry. Um, I think from my family on both sides, I received a lot of different medical pushing, like direction to go in. Uh, my grandfather on the other side was a doctor. My mother's a nurse. My father also volunteered for Hatzola. Uh, and when I came to Israel, I was volunteering from again the Dom, first as an EMT and then as a paramedic. Uh, now in the army, my, my role is also a, a medical role. Um, I definitely think there's some symmetry there. Were you called on following the 7th of October? So on the 7th of October, and about, I think me and Tamar, my wife, woke up at about 6 o'clock uh, because, of, because of the baby. And at 6.30, our phones just started exploding from alerts. Quickly, we, we kind of understood what was going on. Uh, also, the unit from the army told us to be on alert, to be ready. So we, we went back home. I was being prepared, and then within an hour or two, um, I was already called up uh, from Shabbat late morning, um, and it's been in since. Are you able to talk about the sort of work that you're doing without sort of compromising yourself? I mean, what is is there an, an average day at all? So, so we're in a search and rescue unit. Uh, it's a unit which. Day to day, uh, we're on alert, ready, waiting. Sorry, let me start that again. So we are a search and rescue unit. Um, we're based in Jerusalem. We're currently in East Jerusalem. Uh, our role is to provide the response after a rocket attack. So if a rocket hits a building in, in anywhere in the area and there's need for rescue, that's our specialty. Uh, we also deal with earthquakes and stuff like that but that's what we're facing at the moment. In the meantime, we're doing a lot of civilian tasks. So there are a lot of uh, uh, people who are evacuated from the north and the south, and especially for those from the south need assistance in the hotels. Uh, we're there to give them the, the, the reassurance that the IDF is there for them and that we're there to help. And a question for you to give to your grandfather, please. What impact has the 7th of October has on hit, had on him, both as a, as a, as a Jew, as a survivor, uh, and as your grandfather? Saba, the question for you is, what effect did the 7th of October have on you as a Jew, as a survivor, and as my grandfather? It was stunning in, in, in several respects. It was early Saturday morning. Both my wife and I had got up and we were getting ready to go to synagogue. It was the morning of um, Simchat Torah, which is a, one of the happiest days in the Jewish calendar. We had got dressed and we were just um, having a, a hot drink when Uriel, um, having answered his telephone, which he, I believe, as, as a reserve soldier, he's primed to do, regardless of whether it's the Sabbath or not. He had answered his phone, and he had found out that thousands of rockets were being shot into southern Israel, and uh, it, it sounded extraordinarily dramatic and, and uh, cruel. When he told us this, um, his phone rang again, and Uriel very soon decided that he was needed and he needed to go back, almost certainly he would be called up. 
so he packed his bag. We had invited them to spend the last days of Yom Tov with us in Natanya. They arrived on Thursday, and we had a lovely day together with Uriel and his wife, his wife and our great grandson. Uh, we were just getting used to the pleasure and privilege of be becoming great grandparents to a Sabra. And out of the blue, that this tragic event unfolded. And as I said, Uriel packed his bags, got his wife and baby into the car, and felt he had to be on on uh, on duty, on, available. He drove back and dropped his wife and baby with her parents for them to, to care for them. The baby is only three, four months old now. And soon after, he was called up, and he's still in uniform, as you heard. Um, it, it was a very, very dramatic and, and cruel time for me. I, When I came to this country, by this country, I mean the UK, back in 1946, politicians were saying loudly and clearly, never again, never again. And I really believed in that. I did not dream that I would ever again experience either anti-Semitism or even quite unbelievably Holocaust denial by hundreds of thousands of people while they are survivors, first-hand witnesses alive to testify. And as I found out much later, 72 years after I came to this country, I had never ever set foot in either Germany or Poland or any of the camps I had been in, until in 2017, I was asked out of the blue by the Holocaust Educational Trust to return to this most cruel concentration camp of Stuttov, the one I mentioned earlier, which possessed its own extermination facilities, to meet Princess Kate and Prince William, who were paying their first visit to a concentration camp, and they requested to speak to some survivors of the camp. And when I came back there, which was a, a very, very difficult decision for me to make, ever to set foot in, in this camp again, to my amazement, I saw that contrary to what I'd learned over the years, which was that the Nazis invariably, before evacuating a camp which possessed these facilities, blew them up in order not to leave any evidence of, of their crimes. In Stuttov, um, they didn't succeed. Apparently, they also, I was told, laid dynamite around both buildings in order to destroy them before they vacated, before they evacuated the camp. But they set it on a timer to do so after the Nazis had left, and the timer malfunctioned. And as a result, Stuttov, as far as I know, is, I believe, the only camp where a gas chamber and crematorium survived perfectly intact. I actually escorted the young royal couple into the crematorium when, the, when I met them there in 2017, and I can tell you that Princess Kate pulled out a paper hanky to wipe her eyes, and Prince William looked pretty grim when, when they left this facility. The, the ovens were in prime condition, exactly ready to, to just have their button pushed, and they would be back in action. It, it was surreal. To, to see this 70 years after I was there as an inmate. But that, that, that was life. That, that finally convinced me that things don't always work out the way one anticipates. I didn't dream that I would ever experience such a swell of anti-Semitism or Holocaust denial in my lifetime. It didn't seem credible. And I feel that the social websites have turned into a curse of our age. They could have been a blessing educationally, but because they're not 
under any effective control, people have the ability to hide behind false identities while they spew out their poison. I, I feel that the owners of these, I may be going out on a limb here, but I feel that their behavior is close to criminal behavior. They seem to put profit above all else. They say all the right things, that they are sifting the answers and, and trying to cut down on the, the anti-Semitism which is being spread. But in fact, very little seems to have changed until these websites are brought under effective control and the owners themselves are made responsible for the output of these websites in the same way as editors of newspapers are responsible for their output, I think that there's little hope that things will change. And I'm praying for the day that a politician would be sufficiently courageous to initiate such controls. Thank you. Can I ask, Uriel, are you still with us? Yeah, still here. Oh, your video's gone. Yeah, I can see my video. I can't see your video. Neil? Oh, you're back. Um, okay. Would you ask... Okay, fine. Okay, so... Okay, fine. Um, in terms of the rise in anti-Semitism, which is unprecedented since the 7th of October, you mentioned earlier that you feel safer in Israel. Would you want for your grandparents to come and join you? Yes, I definitely, I think I would definitely prefer for them to be here in Israel. Uh, they have a lot of family in England uh, and some family here in Israel as well. Uh, I think now, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I think now they would also uh, feel slightly safer and more comfortable in Israel. Um, but I would definitely want to see my family and as many families as possible coming coming to Israel now. You want to ask your grandfather whether he would ever consider moving to Israel in the light of the, the huge spike in anti-Semitism here? So, Saba, two questions. One, um, do you feel safer in Israel or in England? And number two, would you, would you consider moving to Israel uh, in, in light of the rise in anti-Semitism in England at the moment? Undoubtedly, we, we were in Israel, as you heard, on October the 7th. In fact, uh, Uriel and his family were staying with us. <coughs> Excuse me, please. We, it, it, it took us um, several days to get a flight home because flights were being cancelled. Eventually, we flew home on, on an El Al flight. Days after we were booked to have left Israel, because I had commitments in, in London, speaking commitments, and I didn't want to let people down. But we felt much safer in Israel than we do here. N not a shadow of doubt about it, and I've spoken to friends who feel likewise. As to moving to Israel, we are in a, an insoluble quandary. We have four children, three of whom live in London, and the majority of our grandchildren are here in London. One of our sons lives in Israel, and we have, as a result, several grandchildren in Israel. So, so we, are, we, are, we are torn. Um, and the way we have resolved it in the past is by um, sort of living a little carefully in order to... to <coughs> be able financially to travel to Israel several times a year and spend time with our Israeli family. Some, some years we've spent three or four months in Israel um, and sort of dividing our time between Israel and England in order to stay in touch with all our both children and uh, sons and daughters-in-law, all of whom are wonderful to us, very helpful. And of course, we, we love all our grandchildren and we would like to be on, on a sort of personal, intimate relationships with all of them, which thank God we have achieved. And I, I've said before now, and I'm quite willing to repeat it, that I feel 
one of my major revenges on, on the Nazis is the uh, being able to build our lovely family despite the fact that the Nazis intended to commit this genocide to prove to them that many empires, world empires, have <laughs> fade, faded into oblivion. And we Jewish people, thanks to God's protection, are here, <coughs> virile, alive, and as so, um, goodness personified in, 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 the, in the world wide activities that Israel pursues. My feeling is that the country of Israel is actually living up to God's promise that they should be a light unto the nations. They are indeed. If you look at things objectively, sadly, the world appears to be too blind to see it. I'll just I'll just say me. I'll just say the majority of your great grandchildren live in Israel. It's true. At, at, at the moment, um, in addition to our sons, the, the one who lives in Israel, to his children, which are our grandchildren, we have three other grandchildren, Uriel, and two of his brothers are currently also living in Israel. Um, one is a young married man who, with his wife, lives in Israel, and a single younger brother is in yeshiva in Israel. So all in all, at this moment, our grandchildren are equally divided between Israel and London. Yeah, but your great-grandchildren, with your great-grandchildren, majority is in England, in Israel. Yeah, correct. <laughs> yes, indeed. And be very grateful Luyo. to you and Tamar. Luyo, do you feel, in terms of your grandfather's legacy, that it's part of your responsibility to to be doing what you're doing, to be living <coughs> in Israel? <coughs> you know, you've worked for Magin David Adom. You know, you're, you're now uh, with the IDF. Do you feel that part of your your legacy from your grandfather is to be doing exactly what you're doing. Uh, yes, and I think I think it's everyone's responsibility to to do what they can for for the Jewish people, uh, each on their own level, each in their own way. But I think I've been lucky and blessed to be able to make Aliyah and move to Israel uh, to work in a variety of meaningful uh, and interesting positions, and to be able to meet you through uh, working for NDA. Uh, and and to be able to, to give back and do something for, for the general good. And what what would you say to your grandfather now? I mean, are, are you going to be seeing him anytime soon? Uh, so I don't know. I hope uh, I hope sometime in the near future, um, either I'll be able to go to England or he'll be able to come to Israel. Um, but hoping, hoping to see to see you here here in Israel soon, Saba. So, Uriel, can I said, you repeat yourself, please. Hoping to see you here in Israel soon. Please, please, God, we we certainly hope to come soon. One of my last questions to Manfred is: You've always given testimony, and you're a survivor. Do you feel that part of your survival is the fact that Uriel is as your eldest grandson and now with your first great grandchild living in Israel? Is that you mentioned earlier, major having revenge on the Nazis? Is Uriel doing what he's doing, living in Israel, doing what he's doing? The ultimate, I don't want to say revenge, but it's the ultimate legacy. It's, it's the ultimate tale of survival. So, Saba, the question is, is the ultimate uh, legacy in Tale of Survival, uh, me being here in Israel and being in the IDF and having a great-grandchild here in Israel? It, it certainly is. Um, this may not be totally relevant, 
uh, to our interview. But many years ago, I, I have been married, happily, very happily married for 62 years to a wonderful lady. <clears throat> and when we were engaged, we decided that we wanted to live in Israel as a young married couple. Um, I, it, it, it's not really practical for you, uh, for me to go in, into details, but let me just tell you, despite the fact that I'd missed seven years of education during the war by being in the camps, and even before then, Jewish schools were closed down, so I, I didn't have any education for seven years. After coming to the UK, age 16, um, primarily due to my, my parents' care for me, I was really one in a million survivor, a young survivor with both parents alive. And I had a loving home and caring parents. They deprived themselves of many things to give me an opportunity to try and catch up on my education. And the end result was that I managed to take a degree in electronics at the university um, years and years after I came to the UK. But before I got engaged, as an engaged man, I made a trip to Israel and I was interviewed at the Weizmann Institute who offered me a position and said, whenever you're ready to come, contact us and we'll offer you a position at the Institute because uh, I had an honest degree in uh, an expanding young field of rapidly developing electronics. In those days, the term electronics hadn't been coined yet. It was called light electrical engineering. And we were all set to do this, but Almighty God had other ideas. And as soon as I, soon after I returned from this trip, my late mother fell ill and she was diagnosed as having cancer. I was now an only child. I had a younger brother who was murdered in the camps, aged nine. So I was the only child um, surviving. And I, it was unthinkable for me to make Aliyah live in Israel, leaving my ailing mother and, and father here in, in London. So we changed our plan and we had to, we thought, postpone our Aliyah in order to be near my parents, which we did. Sadly, my mother lived long enough to meet my wonderful wife, Shari, and thoroughly approved of, of her as my future wife. She attended our engagement, but she died weeks before our wedding. We were not permitted to cancel our wedding. It took place as scheduled, but without music. And eventually, we chose to live near my father in Stamford Hill. We had intended moving to northwest London, where many of our friends had moved to, but we couldn't bring ourselves to leave my father on his own. He didn't want to move from North London because he had his established life here in North London. So instead, we decided to live near him so he could spend Shabbat and Jewish holidays with us, which in fact took place for many, many years. I would pick him up every Friday and he would, we had, he had his own room in our apartment and uh, he, he spent Shabbat the whole weekend with us until I took him back to his own apartment. This went on for many, many years and we lived in Stamford Hill in order to be close to him so I could see him during the week as well. So that was how our life was shaped by circumstances rather than our desire. But for that, uh, we would have made Aliyah 60 odd years ago if, if our plan had worked out. But as I said, the Almighty is in charge of running the world and um, I, I guess this is how we were destined to live our life. I think Uriel would probably be very happy to help you pack your bags and get you over to Israel himself and put himself in charge. Michelle said that I, I would be very happy. Can you repeat, please? 
Michelle says that she thinks I would be very happy to pack your bags for you and help bring you over to Israel. She would be very happy to do what? That she thinks that I would be very happy to pack your bags for you and help bring you over to Israel myself. Yes. <laughs> well, maybe, ma ma maybe one day. Who, who knows? No, we do need well, to speak about it took me many, story. many years, let me tell you, that I was unable to speak about my camp experiences, that they were clearly embedded in my mind, but the thought of speaking to people in public, reciting my, my experiences, was unthinkable to me. It took me many, many years, and Uriel had some input in persuading me also to speak, and I began concentrating on speaking to young people in schools. And as a result, it has become apparent to me that listening to the testimony of a survivor who can speak in the first person is one of the most powerful experiences that young people um, can speak about. <coughs> the feedback I've had from many, many young people is that listening to me changed their life. They would never ever forget anything they had heard that day. Some youngsters remarkably would say to me that they were writing down whatever they remembered so that in later years, when they married and had families, they would be able to pass on what they heard from me to their children in turn because quite a proportion of listeners to my testimony would tell me that they had absorbed what I told them and realized that this atrocity would, should never ever be forgotten and they wanted to be in a position to pass it on to their children so that it would not fade from public knowledge after all survivors had passed from this world. So I feel that that is to, to both my credit and to their credit for having absorbed what I'm attempting to do, which is to educate these youngsters. And as a result of having been convinced that this is the most effective way of passing off educating young people, I did resolved that regardless of my age, I would continue doing it, and I am still doing it. This week, later this week, I'm traveling all the way to Sussex University to give a public talk there. I'm told there's probably going to be an attendance of around 400 people, including about 250 secondary school pupils from, from local non-Jewish schools who will attend Sussex University to hear my talk. And I am now, I was considered a child survivor. I was liberated very shortly after my 15th birthday. And I'm now 93, getting on for 94. But as I said, I'm resolved as long as the Almighty gives me the strength to continue, I will do so. Mario, can I ask you, it's a question for both of you. It's one of my last two questions because I, I don't take up any more of your time. At the time of, as the Israel-Hamas war continues, at a time of unprecedented anti-Semitism, if there was a joint message from you and your grandfather on the significance of testimony, of survival, of, of, of endurance, how significant is it that you and your grandfather together are speaking now? What, what message would you give to the Jewish diaspora? So I, I, I think what I take from his, from, his, uh, from his experiences and from our experiences now is that we can't rely on anyone else. Uh, whilst it's nice that other countries do help and we have assistance at the end of the day, if we don't stand up for ourselves, uh, in all aspects, no one is going to no one is going to do it for us, 
And it's important to remember, I think, the, the saying never again, I don't think it means anything nowadays. Um, I think looking at the world and looking at the reactions in other countries, it could definitely happen again. Um, I think we have the responsibility to make sure they doesn't. So Saba, the question was for both of us. Um, it was what would our joint message be to the world? Can you hear me, Saba? So what would our joint you. what would our joint message to the world be? Or to the joint message to the Jewish diaspora um, following the seventh of October event? Well, it's interesting you should ask me that. <clears throat> I was asked the very same question last night. I may, I may have mentioned that I was invited to give a talk. Um, it was called um, Zikaron Besalon. I was invited to the German embassy and with the German ambassador attending and several of his staff. And the audience consisted mostly of uh, young people called ambassadors. I told you that the um, Holocaust Educational Trust runs a program called Lessons from Auschwitz, where they take both history teachers, non-Jewish history teachers from all over England, from schools, on trips to our educational trips to Auschwitz. And some of these uh, attendees become so emotionally involved when they realize the atrocities and the injustice that um, Jewish people suffered during this Holocaust, which I believe is probably very close to, if not the most gruesome atrocity committed in human history. And these youngsters who are so affected volunteer to work for the Educa Educational Trust and they are all grouped under uh, the heading of ambassadors. They become ambassadors for the Jewish people. And about 60 of these attended last night at the German embassy. Uh, most of them were British um, people who had gone to Auschwitz on this educational trip and as a result committed themselves to become ambassadors. But I think around 20 of them the German young people who also are committed to, to working to commemorate the Holocaust and educate people. And one of these ambassadors asked me the same question uh, when it came to question time at the end of my testimony. Her, her question was, please tell us, what do you expect us primarily to be doing uh, in order to fulfill the objective we have set ourselves. And I, I, I need to digress for just a moment. I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. In 2017, I was asked to return to the concentration camp of Stuttov to meet Prince William and Princess Kate. I, I think I've mentioned this already. And the reason I'm mentioning it again is that before they left the camp, they were asked to write a message into the VIP visitors book at Stuttov. And the message they inscribed, which is signed by both of them, it's signed William and Catherine. So this was read, uh, applies to both of them. I won't repeat the whole message, but the essence, the last sentence, um, reads more or less as follows, almost verbatim. I, I probably have most of it in my mind. I have not written it down, so forgive me if I get one or two words wrong. But in essence, what they said, what they left in that VIP visitor's book was that all of us have an overwhelming obligation to ensure that the horrors of the Holocaust are never forgotten in order to ensure that they are never repeated. And I told this young lady who asked the question, that is in essence what we hope you will do. It cannot be long before the era of hearing testimony from a survivor 
is at an end. It, it, it has practically ended now. There are only few of us left. I was a, a child survivor aged just 15 when I was liberated, and I'm now 93. So self-evidently, uh, the, the, the era of Holocaust survivors giving their testimony in the first person is more or less at an end. And we are hoping that just like I answered the ambassadors to these young people who have committed themselves, I'm appealing to everyone who is still in a position to tell, differentiate between evil and goodness, between right and wrong, which unfortunately many young people these days seem unable to do. Um, that is what we hope you will achieve. You will ensure that testimony of the Holocaust remains available to the general public. The Holocaust must not end up as a footnote in a history book. It is absolutely vital, not only for the Jewish people, but I believe for humanity itself, never to forget what hatred can lead to. Because these atrocities, which more often than not start against Jews, think of hijackings. Initially, only Jewish uh, passengers were hijacked, but it didn't remain there. It became fashionable for all terrorists all over the world, whatever cause that they, they pursued, to begin hijackings. And, and it, it spread worldwide. Likewise, don't think if you're not Jewish, you're immune from such atrocities. There have been attempted genocides post-war. Darfur, Bosnia, there are more than that. I, I can't recall the names immediately. But it is a worldwide problem. Don't think, as I said, if you're not Jewish, your future is safe. It is not correct to think that. And please God, you should never experience it. But it is partly for that reason that the horrors, the full horrors of the Holocaust must remain available to people to study and learn in order to, as Prince William and Princess Kate said, to ensure that it is never repeated. That is what I'm asking people to do. Muriel, is there a message you would give as the grandson of a Holocaust survivor to the wider diaspora in terms of the support? There's been a, a huge groundswell of support across the world for Israel. Um, what would your message be, if any, to the communities out there? So I think first, of for, first and foremost, and I think this is a personal message also from me to you as well, um, but also to the larger diaspora is the equipment is, that we really appreciate everything that's been done and everything that um, has been sent to Israel. But as someone in the IDF to receive um, equipment and gifts and messages and letters from people um, who we do know and people who we don't know, showing their support and their feeling and, and the need which they have to be part of the war uh, on behalf of Israel and to do what they can has just been heartwarming. Um, and again, as I said, for people who we do know, you and uh, your brother James has been very has been very helpful. Um, and to people who we don't know who have been sending letters and personal letters um, to soldiers, which we you can't see here, but on the wall behind behind the glass behind me, we have a wall with uh, with all the letters up. Um, it's just been something which has given us strength uh, when we're here for two, three weeks in a row without going home, um, doing whatever we're doing from early in the morning to late at night. It gives us a strength. We're not doing it just for our own family here. We're doing it for the wider community in Israel and outside of Israel. I agree absolutely with what you have just said. The unity which has overnight developed in Israel shows that the Jewish people truly are one. The political differences and the violent uh, demonstrations which took place 
for months in Israel appeared to indicate that the, the Israeli unity had fractured irreparably, but overnight, when faced by a common emergency, the unity shown by the, the, the country of Israel, by the community living there, has been extraordinary, an example to the world of what the word unity truly meant or means. And it is heartwarming. Please God, that should continue. Israel needs to be a unified country and the demonstration of it is really extraordinarily heartwarming. People, our son who, who lives in, who has lived in Israel for more than 20 years, is too old to be called up now, but he's volunteering non-stop, traveling all over the country, doing what he can to assist people. He's made appeals, raised money, uh, personally driven to various parts of the country, delivering help to people who have been evacuated. And he's not the only one. There are many, many tens of thousands of people in this same situation of doing their utmost to keep the country going. Israel is not a country with a large army. The, the army is the, the army of the people. It's, as it says, IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, and that there are ordinary citizens who normally would be doing jobs in offices or laboratories, or what, whatever their profession leads them to, instead of being in uniform and defending the country. An example to the world, if only the world would lift its blinkers and appreciate the extraordinary qualities of the Jewish people and emulate them by caring for, for their own countries in the way Israel cares for its, its citizens, the world would be a much, much better place. Muriel, the last question to you. Do you think by doing what you're doing, you're continuing the legacy of survival of your grandfather? Does it feel like that to you? Uh, I think I think I think what we're doing here is more than just surviving. Uh, I think also what what my Saba did after the war was a stage after surviving was also living uh, and growing up from the age of 15 to until 75, when he started speaking about uh, his experiences, he wasn't a survivor. Uh, none, of his, none of his close family or friends knew, had known what he'd been through. Uh, he didn't show anything externally. And it was only uh, a couple of years ago when he actually started speaking that people realized um, what, he, what he had been going through. And I think that what we're doing here today is more than just surviving. We're not here uh, just to, to to um, to be here, we're here to live, we're here to grow and to uh, to carry on the tradition as well. Is there any last message you'd like to give to your grandfather or just from your grandfather to you before we finish? Saba, do you have any last message for me? Sorry, say it again. Do you have any last message for me? <laughs> For you personally, well, yeah. <laughs> if I can be really personal, I, I would address my message to God Almighty. May he protect you and all the brave soldiers of the country from harm. And may Israel succeed in its quest to ensure that such an atrocity can never, ever be repeated. I didn't dream that I would ever see Jews being slaughtered in these numbers. It, it, it is a, a remarkable revelation to me. It's my faith that keeps me going. Otherwise, I, I don't think I, I would be able 
to to summon up the, the, the courage to remain living in this world. I feel that, as we are told in the Old Testament, God's ways are not our ways. We don't have the ability to understand the way God runs this world. But I have no doubt that he does run it and he does have a plan which would self-evidently fulfill the promises he had made to our forefathers that Israel would, I would say, continue to be a light unto the world because it has been over the last decades. If only the world wouldn't be so blind as to not appreciate this, Israel has been, and please God will continue to be a light unto the nations. So many discoveries made in Israel have improved people's lives worthwhile in many different directions. If there's a calamity, invariably one of the first people to offer assistance is the tiny land of Israel. Likewise, in developing remedies for serious sickness, to improve lifestyles all over the world, helping people both financially, morally. Israel will continue to do this and I hope that there will be a sufficient number of people who will appreciate what in fact Israel is doing should be an example to be followed by many, many other countries in the world. Very sadly, the United Nations has become... Words fail me to say what they have become. I don't want to insult the world, but it is really beyond human understanding to appoint a country like Iran to be head of the... Uh, what's it called, the, the, the International um, Human Rights Organization. It, 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 it just cannot be put into words what one's reaction to this should be. And yet they can get a majority of 100 people voting for, for placing Iran in this position. I don't know what God's plan is, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure that he, he will have a way of dealing with this inexplicable idiocy. Thank you. Thank you. And Uriel, just one last message. Your grandfather's awesome. <laughs> Is there one last message you'd like to give to your grandfather now that you've done this joint interview together? You froze. I missed the whole question. Sorry. Is there one last message that you'd like to give your grandfather on how, what it means to you to be doing an interview five, over five weeks after a horrific massacre with your grandfather, a survivor of the Holocaust, what it, what it means to you to be doing that this today? So I think, I guess also growing up, learning about the Holocaust, um, it was always something theoretical until, until I heard his story, which then made it a little bit more personal, but it was always history. It was always something which had happened and uh, we all knew how terrible it was and nothing like that could ever happen again, obviously. Uh, I think now uh, being able to talk about what's happening now in Israel and happened and uh, I'm sure in the, in, the, in, the, in the following weeks to come, uh, people are going to be, especially in the diaspora, are going to be exposed to a lot more of the atrocities which happened, uh, which isn't well known yet. Uh, I think being able to speak about it and especially to an interview with my grandfather, which I never thought, never thought we'd have to speak about a topic, uh, which we could relate, which I could relate to uh, on an almost personal level. Uh, so I think it's very moving. Um, it's a little bit upsetting. We have to, um, we have to, uh, talk about it and have this interview. Um, but there's no, no one else I would, I would rather do an interview with, even though he's a very difficult act to follow. I don't consider myself God's spokesman, but I do know that I am 
one of um, in, inexplicably a shrinking number of people who can still tell the difference between good and evil. And as a result, I would ask you please to take seriously my views because I'm convinced that I am one of those people and the views you hear from me, I believe, are truly representative of what all decent people in the world would tell you. I certainly feel that the country of Israel is absolutely vital for the continuity of the Jewish people. There is no future for our children here in Israel, in the UK. That is becoming clear by the day. In fact, practically all of Europe, in my opinion, inevitably will be taken over by uh, Islamists. Give it a generation or two. Most European countries have a sizable proportion of Islamic uh, so-called refugees settled in them. They have large families. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> you can see by their behavior at these weekly marches here in the UK and in France what the future holds for Jewish people in Europe. There is no future. Our children, our grandchildren will all end up in Israel, which will be the Jewish country. And may the Almighty keep it mighty and strong in order to ensure that the Jewish people have one little plot on earth in which they can feel safe. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Uriel. Thank you. You know, we love you. <laughs> Thank you so much.